Dr. Bowen back here with you for another session of Microbiology Boot Camp. We are going to now kick off the humongous family of gram-negative bacteria. I say family, it's not phylogically a family, but it is a horde of bacteria that you're going to be responsible for. A lot of clinically relevant bacteria uh, that are gram-negative and so uh, this is very complex, very complicated. You're going to need to know your uh, not only the the what makes gram negative different from gram positive structurally, but there are a lot of different uh, enzymes at play here. A lot of different agar plates that you've got to be familiar with. Growth media, selective media. Uh, so it gets pretty complex, pretty complicated. Uh, not just uh, classifying it by going through our algorithm, but also knowing the diseases that it causes. There are a lot of different diseases uh, that gram negatives cause, from meningitis to diarrhea to uh, dysentery and, and so on and so forth. So lots of things to remember, uh, but uh, as we start, we will... Uh, go through each one. Um, obviously not all of them with this video, but I'm going to give you a nice good overview so you understand what makes gram-negative bacteria gram-negative, what do they all have in common, and then from here we'll go on and we'll talk about each of the individual bacteria, and I estimate it's probably going to be about 20 to 25 videos uh, to go through each of them, but this should be your backbone lecture so that you understand the basics of how gram negatives operate as opposed to gram positives. And if you don't, if you're not familiar with gram positives, go back and watch that video. If you haven't had the opportunity yet, please consider subscribing to my Patreon. I've got the link below in the description of the video, or you can click on the I button on the upper right hand corner. Uh, that should get you there. If you consider chipping in a dollar a month, a little bit goes a long way to help offset the cost of these videos. As you know, I rely on voluntary donations. I make all of my original material free. Unlike most sources, I like to stay true to the Hippocratic Oath, which is that we uh, are to educate our successors for free, free of charge. Uh, instead of making massive profit like some resources do. So anyway, thank you very much in advance. Uh, feel free though also to subscribe to my channel. You'll get updates as I put more material up. All right, now let's get started. If you've watched my gram positive videos, you're probably very familiar with uh, this. This shows the basics of the gram positive cell wall versus the gram negative cell wall. As you can see, the gram negative cell wall is quite a bit more complex. Uh, most obviously here you see a slightly thinner peptidoglycan layer and you also see a double phospholipid bilayer. You have an outer membrane and an inner membrane. And so you need to be familiar with each of these components and what they are, at least the basics of, of you know, what, what purpose they serve. Uh, but as, we're, as we go through all of the gram negatives, you'll see these pop up and their, their relevance to disease process. Uh, so this, again, is just a, a quick overview, uh, but you'll see these things pop up from time to time. As you know, the gram stain, uh, if you watch the gram positive video, you should be familiar with how it works. But basically what we're doing is we are plating the bacteria onto a slide and then we take crystal violet and we fix it with iodine and that gets into the peptidoglycan layer. From there then we wash it with ethanol or acetone and that is going to pull the crystal violet out of the gram negative organisms but it will remain on the gram positive organisms. So what happens then is your gram positive organisms will remain purple your gram-negative organisms will go back to being translucent or in invisible. Then you use saffronin, and saffronin sticks to everything, it sticks to all bacteria. But what happens is that when you stain a gram-positive with saffronin, you're not really going to see it because the crystal violet is, is much more dominant in, you know, color-wise, so it's still going to look purple. 
whereas the gram negative is going to now stain with the safranin and that's all you're going to see and so it will be pink. And so what's really at play here is that peptidoglycan layer. That's most important to understand. And so this is a, a comparison of what gram positive versus gram negative look like under the microscope and we will be constantly referring to pictures of the different bacteria under a microscope as we go through with these lectures as you're probably already familiar if you've watched my gram positive videos. This is an illustration of the gram negative bacterial cell wall. We're going to go through each of these components so you'll be nice and familiar with them. Um, these are all very important that you recognize not only where they are, uh, but also what they do. Now, if you go back to, you know, the 1980s and 1990s when they gave the USMLE, they could have asked you, you know, given you a picture of this and then put an arrow and say, you know, what does this do? And they don't do that anymore now, but uh, you may be asked a question and you know it's a gram-negative organism that's causing it, let's say that you know, the patient has meningococcal meningitis and you know what's causing the disease and then they may ask you which of the following is a component of this bacteria or they may give you a patient with sepsis and they might ask you uh, which of the following components of the bacterial cell wall is responsible for the reaction. Um, and so they can ask you about this in a sort of matter of fact way, but they're not going, I mean, just memorizing this structure and drawing it over and over again is not going to be enough. You need to understand what each of these things do, or at least how they contribute to the pathogenicity or the biology of the bacteria. So here are some key characteristics of the gram-negative wall. Not all of these are unique to the, gra to the gram-negative wall. You see some of these in the gram-positive wall as well. But the most important thing uh, that you know that distinguishes gram-negative from gram-positive is that the gram-negative cell wall has a double phospholipid membrane. It's got an outer membrane and an inner membrane. And that outer membrane is unique to gram-negatives. And what that outer membrane holds are two things porins and lipopolysaccharides. So porins are a diverse set of membrane proteins and the reason that these are important for us is that they are the target of certain antibiotics which use the porins for entry. And a lot of antibiotics need to get into the cell uh, and so you know anything that is going to attack the peptidoglycan layer or get into the cytosol uh, to, to halt protein synthesis. You know, lots of different antibiotics uh, will use porins to get into the cell and the bacteria can mutate its porins to make it uh, resistant to the antibiotics. So that's the porin. The next thing is the lipopolysaccharide. And this is the most important thing I want you to get from the gram-negative wall is the lipopolysaccharide. And the lipopolysaccharide is an endotoxin and it is unique to gram negatives. Now there's some research out there that says maybe one or two gram positive bacteria have a lipopolysaccharide. Don't worry about that. Gram negatives, lipopolysaccharide is unique. Now sometimes you'll, you'll hear lipo oligosaccharide. It does the same thing, but that's something that you see in Neisseria, okay? So it is an endotoxin, and as an endotoxin, it activates toll-like receptor 4, which sits on macrophages and uh, some other cells, dendritic cells. And toll-like receptor 4 activates NF-kappa B, and that goes on to create cytokines. And look at what cytokines it produces. TNF-alpha, IL-1, IL-6, IL-8. What are those things responsible for? They are responsible for sepsis, and IL-8 is responsible for neutrophil hemotaxis. So that creates a septic response, and that's why so many of the gram-negative infections can cause sepsis. We don't see that so much with gram-positive organisms because they don't have lipopolysaccharide. So three components of lipopolysaccharide, as you probably saw here, there are three major components. One is the O antigen or O polysaccharide. This is immunogenic. Now, what do we mean when we say immunogenic? We mean that the immune system can mount a response to it and create antibodies. Um, now, this is lacking on lipo oligosaccharide. 
And that is one way that Neisseria can uh, partially evade an, an immune response, although not completely. Uh, the core polysaccharide is not really well understood, so you don't need to know about that so much. And then lipid A. Lipid A is the component of lipopolysaccharide that acts specifically as the endotoxin, eliciting that massive cytokine response, ultimately leading to sepsis. Next, we have a periplasmic space. Technically, there is a periplasmic space in gram-positive organisms, but it's very small. Uh, it's more pronounced in gram-negative organisms. And really, what a periplasm is, is just an additional cytoplasm. So various metabolic processes take place there. It houses the peptidoglycan layer. Uh, that's pretty much all you need to know for that. Remember that gram-negative bacteria have a thin peptidoglycan layer. The peptidoglycan layer, though, provides it with structural strength. It's also the target of a number of antibiotics. So think of penicillin, vancomycin, uh, that interfere with the production or the integrity of the, uh, of the, 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 the wall. Another one is bronze lipoprotein. This is a little bit lower yield. It's found in some organisms, but not in others. Uh, this binds the outer phospholipid membrane to the peptidoglycan layer, uh, giving it a little bit more integrity. This is also immune, immunogenic, so you can, you can actually mount an immune response to this as well. This is pretty low yield, though. And then there are penicillin binding proteins, just like in gram-positive organisms, and this is responsible for peptidoglycan synthesis, and this is another target of antibiotics. There's some surface elements that I think you should be aware of that I didn't go over in the gram-positive organisms, mostly because these primarily uh, apply to the gram-negatives, not the gram-positives. Uh, but I just want to make you aware of a few different things that can exist on the surface of the bacteria that are not part of the cell wall. And one is pili or fimbriae. And there are three different kinds. As we go through our fimbriated bacteria, we'll talk about these in greater detail. These are primarily on gram-negative uh, bacteria. They're made of glycoprotein. And pili and fimbriae are responsible for adhering to cell surfaces. So adhering to mucosal membranes, for instance. They're also responsible for conjugation, which is bacterial sex. Flagella, as you probably know, are uh, found on both gram-positive and gram-negative organisms, but uh, these are composed of protein, and they're responsible for motility, and you probably know that too. And then there are axial filaments, and axial filaments are primarily found on spirochetes. I didn't put it here, but they are also responsible for uh, motility. So remember, our spirochetes are uh, Borrelia and uh, Leptospira and, uh, and Treponema. Uh, those are uh, spirochetes. They are technically uh, all gram-negative, but I did not include them on the algorithm here because uh, there's some special components to that. When we finish gram-negatives and we move into the spirochetes, uh, you'll see why that is, why I didn't include them. Okay. So morphologically, there are four different ways that we can classify gram-negative bacteria, either as cocci or bacilli. There are two different types of cocci, diplococci, which is exactly the way it sounds, two cocci together in formation, uh, and then coxobacilli, which is not quite spherical, like a traditional cocci, but more elongated, but not quite as elongated as the rod, so they're kind of in between. So diplococci and coxobacilli. And then we have the bacilli, the gram-negative bacilli, and these come in two flavors, curved and not curved. The curved rods, there are three different types that you're going to be, need to be familiar with. And then the other rods are, um, there's a lot. <laughs> so that's, we're going to spend most of our time talking about gram-negative bacilli or gram-negative rods, but there are a lot that you need to be familiar with. All right, so this is our algorithm, and we're going to come back to this again and again. It's huge. Uh, but as we go through our gram-negative diplococci and gram-negative coxobacilli and so forth, uh, I will blow 
each one up so that you can see the basic facts of each one, just like I did with the gram positive algorithm. Um, I can't obviously put everything on here because it would just be way too, uh, I mean, you wouldn't be able to see anything because there's so much information. Uh, but it helps to have a general idea, you know, starting, okay, it stains pink. All right, now what's this? What's the shape of the bacteria? And then from there, there's different things that you want to know. Like for the gram-negative diplococci, you'll need to know is it a maltose fermenter or not. Um, you'll also want to know does it grow on Thayer Martin auger or not. And the reason that I bring this up is because there are a couple things that uh, come up again and again with gram-negative organisms. And we saw it a little bit with gram-positive, uh, but it comes up a lot with gram-negatives. And that is the auger the growth auger. So you need to know which augers grow which bacteria. Or in other words, if you're looking for a specific bacteria, which auger do you want to use to culture it? You could easily get a question where it's abundantly clear what the organism is. So they give you a patient with you know, meningitis, and then they developed a rash, and then they, you know, got really sick, and they, their blood pressure dropped or something like that, and they're clearly describing meningococcal meningitis. They may then ask you, is this a maltose fermenter or not? Does this grow on Thayer Martin auger, or does it grow on chocolate auger, or does it grow on McConkie auger? So you'll need to know all of these augers. You'll need to know what it ferments. You'll, you'll need to know uh, all of this stuff. So I put it on here because this often gets neglected, and I've seen some uh, algorithms online and in review books, and they don't really talk about this, and it's so important because I've seen it come up on so many different test questions. So you can see there are a lot of different augers. They are Martin, Chocolate, Bordeaux Gango, uh, Buffered Charcoal with Cysteine, McConkie is a huge one that you're gonna run into because there are a lot of different gram-negative rods uh, that, that can come up. And so uh, these augers are formulated with certain growth factors, but also certain antibiotics to kill off any other bacteria that you don't want to grow. So it's very selective. Another thing you see, particularly with McConkie agar, is a pH indicator. So that will tell you, for instance, if, if it's lactose fermenting or not. So what happens with McConkie agar is it can grow a lot of different things, but if it ferments lactose, it will grow pink colonies as opposed to colorless colonies or some other color like yellow. And so you need to know how McConkie agar works. And so not only is it important to know how all of these bacteria are classified and the diseases that they cause, but also the agars. Uh, that they're associated with. And then also when we get to the gram-negative curved rods, you'll need to know which conditions they grow in. So for instance, if they grow in really hot conditions, then it's Campylobacter. If they grow in alkaline media, it's Vibrio. If they produce urease and it's a curved rod, then you know you're dealing with H. pylori. So all of these lab specifics, while not very useful clinically, are extremely high yield for step one. And so we're going to talk about that ad nauseum as we go through each of these organisms, okay? So this is an example of gram-negative diplococci. This in particular is Neisseria meningitidis. You'll see with both of the Neisseria and meningitidis and N. gonorrhea that they are capable of growing inside cells. We call that facultative intracellular, and there's eight of them uh, that are really important, and most of them are gram-negative, but you do see a couple of them are gram-positive, which we already talked about, listeria being one, uh, but these can all grow inside cells. And remember, that is a virulence factor uh, because you can evade the immune system that way. So as we go on to Neisseria, which will be our first uh, group of gram-negative bacteria, we'll talk about its ability to grow inside cells. But you can see quite clearly here what I wanted to illustrate is the diplococci formation of this particular bacteria. Here you see gram-negative coxobacilli. Now, uh, the coxobacilli are not quite rods, but they're not quite, uh, they're not quite cocci either. They're kind of in between. 
Now, one thing you see with this one that you don't see with all of the cocks of the psoa, you see with this one in particular, is that it's got a capsule. And remember that capsules are very important because they allow us an antigen that we can then use to create a vaccine. All right, this is H influenza, Haemophilus influenza. We don't know the type just by looking at it, but it uh, is a coxobacilli that has a capsule, and that is quite clearly uh, H influenza. Okay, and you should know all your encapsulated bacteria. These are the curved rods, so you can see they're long, much longer obviously than the coxobacilli. They're long, but these ones are curved. So yeah, they're obviously curved, and there are going to be three curved rods that you're going to want to know. You're not going to be able to tell one curved rod from the next, but they may tell you, for instance, that this grew in alkaline media, or this was found to be urease positive, or it grew at 42 degrees Celsius. Or they may come back and tell you that this is... Uh, this was taken from the stomach, for instance, in a patient who's had an ulcer, and uh, they may then show you a picture of this, and they might ask you, uh, which of the following traits does this have? Does it grow at 42 degrees Celsius? No, that's Campylobacter. Does it grow in alkaline media? No, that's Vibrio. The answer would be that it's got urease. So that's another way that they could frame a question for you that really just pertains to the basics of microbiology. And then finally, we have the other gram-negative rods, which are just plain old straight rods, and there are a ton of these. I can't even uh, begin to tell you how many of these there are, and we're going to spend the bulk of our time talking about these. But again, you see that these are obviously rods, and they're not curved. So <laughs> these are the other gram-negative rods here. Anytime you have a gram-negative rod, your first step is going to be to culture it on the conchi, and that tells you if it's lactose fermenting or not. And then this is E. coli, which is one of our lactose fermenting gram-negative rods. And finally, this is another algorithm that you can screenshot and print out if you want. Uh, this one I found online. Obviously, this is a lot prettier, uh, but the reason I make my own is because there are a lot of things that it just, uh, this does not tell you. And, and the one big thing is the agar. And the agar is very important. It comes up on your exam. So this is not enough for you to know. But it does point out something I probably should have included in, uh, in, in mine. Uh, and I'll probably include it as I, as I go through and, and uh, blow each, each group up, uh, is which of these are aerobic. Okay, so these are your aerobes here, Neisseria and Moraxella, Bordetella. Uh, and then there were other aerobic bacteria that we talked about in our gram-positive section, like Nicardia uh, and so forth. Okay, so that is it for our overview. All right, are you pumped? I'm pumped. We're going to talk about our gram-negative diplococci first, so uh, await those videos as they come out. And we're going to be talking about Neisseria and Moraxella. Neisseria, very, very important, Come, comes up all the time on the exam. Lots of different virulence factors uh, you'll have to be familiar with. So those videos might be a little bit long, okay? I will see you there.